So welcome to this afternoon's mega session, which is building resilience and your brand. I always love things about building your brand because I don't think people think enough about their own personal brand. Um, Allison's nodding, so that's good. I think she's going to be covering that. Um, so I'd like to welcome Allison Stewart Allen. Uh, she is a renowned marketer whose expertise is brand internationalization. Um, she is sought by leading businesses globally through her consultancy, publications, appearances, and corporate education. Uh, she is a Californian who's been based in Europe for over 25 years, and we got to, I got to hear a little bit of, of how that happened, uh, so maybe she'll share a little bit of that. Um, she applies her extensive international consulting experience MBA education with Dr. Peter Drucker and her language skills in French and German uh, to the company she founded. International Marketing Partners, um, using the brand travel methodology, Allison helps companies and their leaders to successfully and profitably span international and functional boundaries by giving them the tools to be more effective in a global arena. The benefits clients enjoy as a result include better localization, increased corporate diplomacy capability, and more effective relationships with internal and external shareholders. Um, I think um, her uh, Twitter handle is there, Muse of Marketing. I love that. So I'm going to be uh, tagging her in some social media posts this afternoon. So with that, let's welcome Allison. Great. Thank you. So welcome, and it's fantastic having you here. Uh, the structure of the next hour or so will mean that you'll be getting to have conversations with uh, the people with you uh, and around you. As much as me giving you ideas, you too will have to use these ideas and apply them. Uh, so this is a little bit of work rather than just being able to just listen. You'll actually do something. So, because of that, I see there's a few stragglers uh, in various parts of the room who are sitting on their own. Please, would you find at least two other people, so you're sitting in groups of three or more, uh, because when we get to the conversation part, you can use these other brains to help you think things through. So thank you very much for your reshuffling. Okay, so I'm delighted you're here uh, because I think what you'll find over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, because uh, I'd like to allow time at the back end for questions because that's when you bring the ideas uh, we talk about to life. Uh, but over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to look at a few key things, uh, namely your leadership journey, what we mean by resilience, and ways you can influence and persuade other people. But as you heard a little about me, the other thing uh, as well, uh, to add to what Karen said, is I've written a book which, uh, given who's in the White House, is increasingly proving to be interesting for people, uh, called Working with Americans. Uh, so I'm, in, I'm also spending a lot of time trying to interpret uh, that leadership profile, uh, and it isn't an easy one, I have to tell you. So this is uh, sort of the agenda for the next 45 minutes. So let's uh, look a little bit uh, as, at why resilience uh, increasingly is on your agenda and on the agenda of the organizations that you work in. So uh, we'll roll this short film.
So I expect all of you are facing that world, uh, not the world of 1994, but now we're in a very different place. And we, that's happened really, really quickly. And with that has come a lot of change. And one of the challenges for uh, coping with change is being able to bounce back and being able to bounce back quickly, which is fundamentally what resilience is about. So this is the VUCA environment, uh, and it probably feels like that to you most of the time. It certainly does to me. Uh, living in London as I do with Brexit, uh, which was an unexpected development, uh, certainly for people in London, it's surprising. Uh, you have obviously uh, uh, the what's happening in America, uh, you have not just geopolitical, but you have health uh, changes. You have the ransomware uh, virus from only Friday. So, and that's just the begin. We're only on 20, you know, we're not even halfway through 2017. And just think of all the things that have gone on already in the, in the first five months or so of this year. So VUCA, if you haven't heard that expression, that's very much what's behind why resilience is an increasingly valuable skill. V for volatile, U for uncertain, C for complex, and A for ambiguous. And it started as a military term back in the 1980s to describe the terrain in which conflicts uh, and conflict zones uh, are uh, operating. But actually, when we're talking about this concept of resilience and the ability to bounce back, I'm sure you're finding that increasingly you're in these very uncertain uh, environments at work and you're trying to drive change and you're trying to drive change and lead change in your companies or organizations when you have all of this contextual stuff going on in the background. And it's hard uh, and it's getting harder and that's why the skill around resilience is one that you are right to want to build even further. So adding to the contextual climate that makes resilience valuable uh, and why increasingly you're uh, looking to know more about this. So every year, uh, a company called Edelman uh, started as a public relations firm. It's also a corporate affairs consulting business. Uh, Richard Edelman, for the last 16 years, or 13 years, sorry, has produced the Trust Barometer. And basically what he's done is he surveyed what he calls informed publics. So people like us, uh, usually professionals, uh, who have degrees, who have X number of years uh, in the workforce, and ask their attitudes towards different aspects of corporations, governments, NGOs, the media. Uh, the latest report, which comes out every January, this year's report is online. You can download it and watch it on SlideShare, or you can download it and look at it as a PDF. But it's fascinating, and it's showing an interesting trend. And that is that the worlds that we inhabit in work, in the world of work, are increasingly proving to be more complex places where em target employees or people working in companies are less and less satisfied. Uh, they trust their employer ever less. And that's a problem because if you're trying to retain talent like yours, and the talent on the teams that you even lead or that you work alongside, that's gonna be really hard as people retreat from trusting companies and other types of organization. So this is just a really quick screenshot from this January's report. And what you're seeing is uh, the response to questions about how should companies behave, what's important, and therefore the leaders in companies and their behavior, what's important to these informed publics, and how well are the, our companies generally doing on these attributes. So again, what this is telling you is that there's a big gap between what people think is important in terms of corporate behavior and how well these businesses are doing. Uh, and generally, the bigger this gap, the bigger the issue, and the bigger the disconnect between your expectations and the behavior of the business or businesses as a whole globally. So this survey takes in organizations from all over the place. How does this link back to resilience? Well, 
You could say that this is a, a snapshot of corporate resilience, the alignment between what an organization should be doing and the expectations of people for an organization to do and what it really is delivering. And there is consistently across these 15 attributes a gap. And so therefore, from a point of view of you as uh, leaders of teams or managers of teams, these are the leadership behaviors that are, need to be sustained, which is what resilience is about, in the face of these major headwinds that we're experiencing in geopolitical terms, in socioeconomic terms. So, I really love this quote from Winston Churchill uh, because it's positive, because it's really easy to be knocked by unexpected events, unintended consequences, uh, viruses, etc., as uh, I mentioned. And yet his view is that the optimist, which is how we should see uh, resilience through the lens of positive opportunity, uh, sees that uh, in every difficulty. So I guess having the, the lens that means that uh, your resilience is to be shaped and your uh, ability to bounce back is because you're exploiting an opportunity presented by that unexpected event or series of events. And there always are opportunities. So while it's painful maybe at the time you're going through uh, a transition or a major change or a huge disruption that wasn't expected, there is always an opportunity to exploit that situation uh, and use it for learning for yourself personally, for your professional development as well, for your career. So I think the reason this resonated anyway for me is because it's a very positive view uh, of resilience. So the reason for showing you uh, an iceberg is because what your uh, people uh, in your organization and the teams that you work with will see is the stuff above the waterline. How you're responding to these challenging situations, to stresses, to disruptions, uh, and the stuff below the waterline is really the core of who you are, your values, your beliefs that drive the behavior that they see above the waterline. And therefore, the more you focus on these values and beliefs, the more you remind yourself that you've been through really tough situations in the past and you bounce back. You've got the skills, you've got a track record of doing that, the more the stuff above the waterline looks calm. And if you think about resilience in the context of driving change or responding to change and disruption, then that will happen well when you're very clear what you believe in, why you believe in it, and you let other people know who you are and what you're about, and that explains what they see above the waterline. So resilience is both a combination of your track record, the fact you've bounced back before, and also who you are at your core and how other people know you as a leader of teams or as an influencer, as someone that's driving change, as someone that's having to uh, make organizational changes, I'm assuming, and that might have an impact also on you. So, here are the characteristics of resilience. This is how you know you've got it, right? So, and they're, they're all equal. They aren't, uh, they're not in an order, but they're all equal. So one is to stay healthy, to stay balanced, uh, to, to eat properly, that you're getting sleep, uh, you're uh, not ill. Uh, another is being able to quickly bounce back, regain balance, equilibrium, uh, after you've been disrupted. And the disruption can be personal, can be professional, can be a combination. Doesn't matter the source, it's your response to the trigger that matters. High levels of productivity when you're in a highly unclear, ambiguous, VUCA type of situation. So when you're still able to function and function at a high level when you've been, you know, jolted, that's how you know you've got resilience. And resilience is buildable, and I'll come on to that in just a moment because you're probably wondering, okay, get on with it, what do I do? How do I get more of it? 
So I'm coming on to that in a second. Uh, avoiding the symptoms uh, of future shock. So in other words, you're not completely immobilized and paralyzed by all of the complexity and ambiguity and emotions that come with being disrupted. Because being disrupted isn't just a necessarily a physical thing uh, or a contextual thing. It's also your emotional response to the situation. Uh, and fundamentally, controlling and helping yourself and talking yourself through that is what resilience does uh, and is and make, means you can get through it faster and get through it uh, even more productively and as a smarter, more insightful person than before. And then finally, uh, rebounding from uh, pressure, uh, the pressure of change and coming out the other side being even stronger than before it ever happened. So you can see that all of these are suggesting positive outcomes from resilience and seeing the disruption as a mechanism that actually makes you stronger and makes you better and makes you clearer and makes you know yourself even more. And you've all got that already. You may not think you do, but you do because you have been in situations before and you have come through them. And you've come through them learning something. It may have been painful and it probably was, but you've come through with some insight. So, there's a fantastic author called Linda Hoops, who's written a book very recently called Prozilience, not resilience, but Prozilience. Uh, and its own Dara Press published her book about three weeks ago. Uh, but Linda's a recognized expert uh, in uh, the psychology of resilience. And one of the many things she has is a great model, which I'll show you in just a moment. But her model is constructed on these characteristics of resilient individuals. And her research over several 20 years, 20 plus years in fact, has led her to this conclusion that resilient people are able to look at the world and respond through these behaviors. Because fundamentally what resilience is, is behavior. It's how you respond, what, you, what actions you take, what decisions you take and action and implement on the back of some disruption. So you can see there's two aspects there of positivity, back to sort of Churchill's quote. One is positive about the world. Are you generally positive about the state of the world? Uh, now, you may not be, uh, and that may make your ability to rebound harder. And so what her research shows is people that are generally more optimistic about the state of the world are able to come back quicker from knocks. Another is being positive about yourself and, your, and self-confidence to some extent. How well uh, you believe you've been able to weather upset and upheaval and complexity and your view that you can get through things. Uh, and that too affects the speed of uh, rebounding on the back of some uh, disruption or change. Um, how focused the person is, is another characteristic. So as you can see, a resilient people are really clear what they want to achieve and what they, uh, the opportunity might be presented to them by some sort of change. Flexible in terms of thinking. So, in a way, diversity of thought. So one of the really great things that you've got here at SWE in Amsterdam, in your global organization, is the ability to connect to a really diverse group of fantastically smart people. And using that network, whether it's an SWE network, it's a professional network in your own organization, LinkedIn, friends, family, doesn't really matter. The more diverse your network, the better ideas you get. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of great research about boardrooms. The more diverse boardrooms are, the higher actually the returns are and earnings per share are. So there's bottom line impact for co in a commercial context. There's also in the interpersonal context, the fact that the broader the views you solicit, the better ideas you will ultimately get from a kind of genetic pool perspective. Uh, another is uh, flexible around uh, social, 
Uh, so resilient people draw on others uh, for help. So asking for help is also a predictor of speed of, res of uh, bounce back. Organized, so re highly resilient people uh, are super organized and methodical in how they plan to come back. So they're good planners. Uh, they're meticulous in identifying the steps to work through that situation of change. And last but not least, proactive. So taking the initiative, making things happen, uh, leading uh, the way for themselves and for other people to navigate through something that is stressful uh, and disruptive and a, a trigger for change. So given Linda's model, you have potentially a profile. So one of the things that uh, this organization, interestingly called the Resilience Alliance has, is a diagnostic. And you can answer the 100 or so questions and get a profile of how resilient you are. So I was sent a sample profile because I wanted to see what it does before I paid for one. And that you get a generic report, uh, but you get one also about your own resilience. And based on the answers to the questionnaire, you get your picture of, of how prepared you are to cope in extreme cases of change. So here's the sample profile, uh, looking at the uh, one, two, three, four, five, seven characteristics that are gonna predict the ability to bounce back from a knock. So what I think would be really useful, which is why I wanted you to talk to and sit, sit with other people, hopefully you have a sheet of paper handy, but if you had to predict your own profile, so how resilient do you think you are? How do you think you'd score out of 100 on these seven attributes? Where do you think you would put your uh, scores or your bars? And in talking to the people next to you, I'd like you to solicit at least one idea from the other people you're discussing with this with, one idea from this diversity, which is, as you heard earlier, one of the ways that you get uh, through, through um, uh, resilient, get build resilience, uh, at least one idea for something you can do to build on one of the attributes where you're not at 100. Maybe one of your lower scores. What do you think you could do that would make that stronger? So, as I, you heard me say, I won't do all the talking for the 45 minutes. I think you ought to uh, use some of these tools. So I'm going to hand it over to you for the next few minutes, and I'll come back. And I'm not going to ask for volunteers to feedback because I don't. It's for you. It's not for me. Uh, but uh, it would be useful just to maybe gauge from a couple of you whether there was some insight in that conversation that you got some good ideas for things you could do that build your own resilience. So for the next few minutes or so, five, six minutes, over to you. Pause your conversations. I don't want them to stop. And I'm hoping that even over the breaks, over the course of tomorrow, uh, later today, that you will keep this conversation going with the people sitting with you or other people. Uh, but just a couple of insights. Was, what did you get from that conversation? You don't need, nothing personal, but in terms of ideas. Was it useful? Yes, please. Because we're all women. <laughs> So I think it's a bit, uh, it's part of our DNA as yeah. well to have this resilience because we have to work harder and th yeah, that's just the way the world is. Mm. But the other thing uh, we concluded as well was you can't really look at resilience as one individual element of behavior because it's very much interlinked with all sorts of other behaviors. Yes. And your level of resilience doesn't just depend on you. Uh, because the company, the environment you work for is going to have an immense, because you could be very resilient in another environment, but you can't be because that environment doesn't allow you to. So, so I think it, 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 it has so many external factors that can impact that. That was kind of where we were yep. going with our yep. conversation. I would, I would totally agree with you. It's highly contextual. And your ability to bounce back is very much a function of the context in which you, you are existing 
your support network, the, cult, cult, uh, the corporate culture of the organization you're in, absolutely shapes that. Yeah, I would completely agree. Right, one more comment. No? Yeah? We have mics. Yes. So everyone can hear you, so thank you. Firstly, I, oh, that's loud. Uh, firstly, I agree that um, it would be interesting to hear the male point of view as well to see whether there is some differences. So obviously, we're all pretty much all women. There are some guys in here, sorry. <laughs> um, I also think that it's valid to say that um, some of those things people will actually focus on internally themselves. Um, so I know that flexible social and probably being positive about myself are things that I'm really not good at and I acknowledge that. So every day I do work on those to bring those up. So maybe I actually score quite highly in those because of what I force myself to do. Mm -hmm. So the reason that this could be really helpful and, and uh, is important to understand is because you might not realise that all of those are things that could affect you. Yeah. So some of the lowest scoring ones are the things you're not already focusing on. So yes. that's why I felt it was such a good conversation to have and such a nice set of criteria. Yeah, good. Uh, so th there's more on this model, by the way, online. So by all means, if you look up Resilience Alliance, uh, you look up Linda Hoops, you can find even more about it. Uh, but what it does do is it's meant to focus the mind uh, and highlight, uh, whoops, clicker? Thank you. Uh, and highlight where you maybe are weaker uh, where you've given yourself a lower score, and think about ways you can build that up. Okay, so uh, the second of three parts today is the leadership journey. Uh, and this is about the confidence piece. This is about taking time to reflect on your track record and how you have bounced back from some pretty tough things and tough stuff. So the goal really is to give you a script and a narrative, not only for yourself, because sometimes we have these voices that say, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Oh, oh I'll never get through that. Oh, that's impossible. To actually saying, actually, it's not impossible. I've done tough stuff before. I've come through really difficult situations and never thought I would and I have. And by being able to think about it in the form of a story, you're able to inspire and engage other people who maybe don't think they can get through something, friends, families, colleagues, depending on the context. Uh, and so what this does, this leadership journey idea, is it gives you a way of thinking about packaging your story. Why a story? Because we're wired to remember stories. The human brain, uh, and I suspect we've got some neuroscience and uh, other people uh, in the room that are far more expert on this than I am. But the research I, ha I know through my work in the marketing field is that the brain is wired to remember stories. We don't remember spreadsheets. I know that's a shock, isn't it? <laughs> or PowerPoint presentations or lots of words on slides. That's not what you're going to remember from today. You're probably going to remember maybe a picture or two, you'll probably remember the iceberg. You might remember the bar charts with the seven uh, attributes of resilience. There's another uh, couple of images coming up that you'll probably remember. And you remember the stories I've told you. So here's a story. This is a leadership lifeline as a way to get your story told. So this is my leadership lifeline story. So the horizontal is age, and I'm a little older than where it says today uh, when I first did this. But by recognizing three key people who have helped me get through really tough situations, they're part of the story. And the story has to have humans in it because generally we don't remember stories unless people are involved. So the story uh, is some highlights, some lowlights. Plus 10 is a highlight. Minus 10 is really a low. Uh, but by telling this story to people, I'm reminding both myself, but inspiring hopefully other people to get through really tough situations. And for them to find the inner strength and the resilience and for them to think of situations they've been in that have been tough and that they've bounced back. So that's the purpose of having something like this leadership lifeline as a visual or just to turn it into a narrative. So you can see there's a few highs. When I was aged eight, I moved to Munich, Germany. 
Uh, lived there for four years because my dad got a job transfer. I was fluent in Bavarian German, which I'm told is not really German. For German speakers in the room, it's a form of German. But uh, so I was completely fluent in Bavarian German and moved back to LA and had to have English tutoring to relearn English and got my word structure, sentence structure all messed up and put the verb at the end and it sounded really, made no sense. Uh, so that was the age eight, that was a huge high. Another high at 22 was getting into an MBA program that I never thought I'd get into. Uh, so that was great, but then at 29 I had the death of an uncle and I was really close to him. Uh, and that was really a low and that was a low for a long time. Uh, but then, uh, uh, interestingly, when I was 30, I met this great guy, uh, and um, that helped. Uh, but that's not why I met him, it was just circumstance, uh, and that was definitely a high. It should be higher than, I realize, I, I think I put Graham at five, that's so not fair. <laughs> uh, I'll have to change that. Um, and then uh, at 41, I won a couple of awards, and that was another high. I mean, I haven't put all the lows on here. There were more lows than just that one, I have, you know. Uh, but ultimately, these three people had it a lot, to, you know, my uh, professor during my MBA program, my dad and my husband, have played a huge role in helping me over the course of my life and in some ways cope with those lows and those highs. So what... I now am going to ask you to spend a couple of minutes on is your own journey. And literally, it's a quick few minutes individually. If it's helpful to talk to the people sitting with you, by all means. But again, what this is doing is it's reminding you that you've been through some tough things and you've done it and you came out the other side. And here you are in Amsterdam in your profession, doing really well. Fantastic. So I'm just going to let you reflect for a couple of minutes on what your leadership lifeline would look like because that forms the basis of your story that helps other people but also reminds you of your own resilience. Uh, but you've got the tool and you know how to use it so by all means I'd recommend seeing how you can deploy this when you get back uh, next week with colleagues. Okay, last section, because I want to make sure I allow at least a couple of minutes, a few minutes for Q&A. Right, influencing to lead change, right? So resilience only is required in situations that require change. You're in roles that mean you have to demonstrate what good looks like in the face of change. So there's a fantastic video I'm going to show you now. It takes a short few minutes with six ways to influence and persuade. And as you're watching this, I'd like you to please think about which of these you already think you do and are naturally comfortable and in your repertoire now, and which of the six are not and could be. So it's really just to broaden your exposure to other ways to influence and persuade other people with some very interesting stats as well. So if we can roll the film. Thank you. Researchers have been studying the factors that influence us to say yes to the requests of others for over 60 years. And there can be no doubt that there's a science to how we are persuaded. And a lot of this science is surprising. When making a decision, it would be nice to think that people consider all the available information in order to guide their thinking. But the reality is very often different. In the increasingly overloaded lives we lead, more than ever, we need shortcuts or rules of thumb to guide our decision making. My own research has identified just six of these shortcuts as universals that guide human behavior. They are reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking, and consensus. Understanding these shortcuts and employing them in an ethical manner can significantly increase the chances that someone will be persuaded by your request. Let's take a closer look at each in turn. So the first universal principle of influence is reciprocity. Simply put, people are obliged to give back to others the form of behavior, gift, or service that they have received first. 
If a friend invites you to their party, there's an obligation for you to invite them to a future party you are hosting. If a colleague does you a favor, then you owe that colleague a favor. And in the context of a social obligation, people are more likely to say yes to those that they owe. One of the best demonstrations of the principle of reciprocation comes from a series of studies conducted in restaurants. So the last time you visit a restaurant, there's a good chance that the waiter or waitress will have given you a gift, probably at about the same time that they bring your bill, a liqueur perhaps, or a fortune cookie, or perhaps a simple mint. So here's the question, does the giving of a mint have any influence over how much tip you're going to leave them? Most people will say no, but that mint can make a surprising difference. In the study, giving diners a single mint at the end of their meal typically increased tips by around 3%. Interestingly, if the gift is doubled and two mints are provided, tips don't double. They quadruple, a 14% increase in tips. But perhaps most interestingly of all is the fact that if the waiter provides one mint, starts to walk away from the table, but pauses, turns back, and says, for you nice people, here's an extra mint, tips go through the roof. A 23% increase, influenced not by what was given, but how it was given. So the key to using the principle of reciprocation is to be the first to give and to ensure that what you give is personalized and unexpected. The second universal principle of persuasion is scarcity. Simply put, people want more of those things they can have less of. When British Airways announced in 2003 that they would no longer be operating the twice daily London, New York Concord flight because it had become uneconomical to run, sales the very next day took off. Notice that nothing had changed about the Concord itself. It certainly didn't fly any faster, the service didn't suddenly get better, and the airfare didn't drop. It had simply become a scarce resource, and as a result, people wanted it more. So when it comes to effectively persuading others using the scarcity principle, the science is clear. It's not enough simply to tell people about the benefits they'll gain if they choose your products and services you'll also need to point out what is unique about your proposition and what they stand to lose if they fail to consider your proposal. Our third principle of influence is the principle of authority, the idea that people follow the lead of credible, knowledgeable experts. Physiotherapists, for example, are able to persuade more of their patients to comply with recommended exercise programs if they display their medical diplomas on the walls of their consulting rooms. People are more likely to give change for a parking meter to a complete stranger if that requester wears a uniform rather than casual clothes. What the science is telling us is that it's important to signal to others what makes you a credible, knowledgeable authority before you make your influence attempt. Of course, this can present problems. You can hardly go around telling potential customers how brilliant you are, but you can certainly arrange for someone to do it for you. And surprisingly, the science tells us that it doesn't seem to matter if the person who introduces you is not only connected to you, but also likely to prosper from the introduction themselves. One group of real estate agents were able to increase both the number of property appraisals and the number of subsequent contracts that they wrote by arranging for reception staff who answered customer inquiries to first mention their colleagues' credentials and expertise. So, customers interested in letting a property were told, lettings? Let me connect you with Sandra, who has over 15 years experience letting properties in this area. Customers who wanted more information about selling properties were told, speak to Peter, our head of sales. He has over 20 years experience selling properties. I'll put you through now. The impact of this expert introduction led to a 20% rise in the number of appointments and a 15% increase in the number of signed contracts. Not bad for a small change informed from persuasion science that was both ethical and costless to implement. The next principle is consistency. People like to be consistent with the things they have previously said or done. Consistency is activated by looking for and asking for small initial commitments that can be made. In one famous set of studies, researchers found rather unsurprisingly that very few people would be willing to erect 
an unsightly wooden board on their front lawn to support a drive safely campaign in their neighborhood. However, in a similar neighborhood close by, four times as many homeowners indicated that they would be willing to erect this unsightly billboard. Why? Because 10 days previously, they had agreed to place a small postcard in the front window of their home that signaled their support for a Drive Safely campaign. That small card was the initial commitment that led to a 400% increase in a much bigger but still consistent change. So, when seeking to influence using the consistency principle, the detective of influence looks for voluntary, active, and public commitments, and ideally gets those commitments in writing. For example, one recent study reduced missed appointments at health centers by 18% simply by asking the patients rather than the staff to write down appointment details on the future appointment card. The fifth principle is the principle of liking. People prefer to say yes to those that they like. But what causes one person to like another? Persuasion science tells us that there are three important factors. We like people who are similar to us, we like people who pay us compliments, and we like people who cooperate with us towards mutual goals. As more and more of the interactions that we are having take place online, it might be worth asking whether these factors can be employed effectively in, let's say, online negotiations. In a series of negotiation studies carried out between MBA students at two well-known business schools, some groups were told, time is money, get straight down to business. In this group, around 55% were able to come to an agreement. A second group, however, were told, before you begin negotiating, exchange some personal information with each other, identify a similarity you share in common, then begin negotiating. In this group, 90% of them were able to come to successful and agreeable outcomes that were typically worth 18% more to both parties. So to harness this powerful principle of liking, be sure to look for areas of similarity that you share with others and genuine compliments you could give before you get down to business. The final principle is consensus. Especially when they are uncertain, people will look to the actions and behaviors of others to determine their own. You may have noticed that hotels often place a small card in bathrooms that attempt to persuade guests to reuse their towels and linen. Most do this by drawing a guest's attention to the benefits that reuse can have on environmental protection. It turns out that this is a pretty effective strategy, leading to around 35% compliance. But could there be an even more effective way? Well, it turns out that about 75% of people who check into a hotel for four nights or longer will reuse their towels at some point during their stay. So what would happen if we took a lesson from the principle of consensus and simply included that information on the cards and said that 75% of our guests reuse their towels at some time during their stay? So please do so as well. It turns out that when we do this, towel reuse rises by 26%. Now imagine the next time you stay in a hotel, you saw one of these signs. You picked it up and you read the following message. 75% of people who have stayed in this room have reused their towel. What would you think? Well, here's what you might think. I hope they're not the same towels. And like most people, you probably think that this sign will have no influence on your behavior whatsoever. But it turns out that changing just a few words on a sign to honestly point out what comparable previous guests have done was the single most effective message, leading to a 33% increase in reuse. So, the science is telling us that rather than relying on our own ability to persuade others, we can point to what many others are already doing, especially many similar others. So there we have it, six scientifically validated principles of persuasion that provide for small, practical, 
often costless changes that can lead to big differences in your ability to influence and persuade others in an entirely ethical way. They are the secrets from the science of persuasion. So hopefully that's got you thinking about some of the things you do by default because they're comfortable and you do them anyway and some other things and techniques that you think, actually, God, that could really work in this situation. Why? Because you're leading change and you're trying to help people be resilient in the face of it. So, moving on quickly, what would be useful to, for you to do after today is to sort of consolidate some of the ideas we've been discussing. So thinking about, you know, you're from and to, where are you trying to get to in being more resilient? Think about your bar charts on those seven attributes. Uh, you're reflecting on you as a leader, your own leadership journey and that narrative, how you can share that. Uh, and then take action, proactive. What's one thing you might do differently on the back of some of the ideas today, some of the conversations you've started with other people, and that way, you can make sure that your own resilience and the resilience of the people around you is further built. So some interesting readings. You'll get these slides, by the way, after today. Uh, but these might be some reference points for you if you want to keep learning about this whole concept of resilience. And we've got only a few minutes because uh, I should have uh, perhaps thought about the time it might take for you to have your conversations with other people, but that's fine. Uh, so we've got only a brief few minutes left. Can we take a few questions? I see a hand at the back, and a mic is just on its way to you. Thank you. Uh, to the topic of persuasion, I would like, uh, so I always have a, have a good feeling with persuasion. I would like to be more persuas persuasive, or how to say. But uh, I always think, how much of it is it good? Uh, how does it differ to manipulation? Uh, so manipulation um, assumes that you're motivated by, um, uh, by a, for a negative reason, that you're trying to get someone to do something that they don't want to do already. Uh, influence is what you do anyway. Uh, and persuasion and influence are compatible and intermingled. So influencing and persuading someone to think differently, to look at the world differently, is what this is suggesting you can do even more effectively with a broader repertoire. But manipulation assumes that the person you're trying to influence doesn't want to do the change or make the change that you want them to make. That's different. Influence is what you do on social media. It, influence is what your LinkedIn profile looks like. Influence is how you tell your leadership journey. Uh, the examples, for example, with the tips, um, is this influence or is this manipulating? Uh, well, I think if you're in a competitive environment and you are trying to win hearts and minds of other people on your team, for example. Influencing is something that you have to do as a leader in any context. Uh, and I don't think that's manipulation. Manipulation assumes a negative motive. This is not a negative motive. This is about how you get your ideas out there and win other people over to your point of view. Yeah. Any other questions or comments of the, about the session or any other content, please? Here comes your mic. Oh, I would like to know what is your um, your best example in your lifeline, right? Uh, where you rebounded, you had a rebound, and how did you overcome it? Uh, so what was a setback in my leadership journey, and how did I overcome it? Um, so there have been many. Uh, and if I think generically, um, I probably would say how I overcome it is by talking to other people. But that's, a, that's, I would say that as an extrovert, wouldn't I? <laughs> uh, but I find other people really helpful uh, because by just even talking about some of the things uh, that have been problems for me in the past, by sharing it, 
it feels better. So I think I just get other points of view and advice from other people, and I think taking the actioning the advice is what's, what makes the difference. Listening to it or having it is one thing, doing something with it is the other thing, and it's the doing something with it that's been the key. And I think that's been, been, been a critical thing for me. Well, I'm conscious of time and that I don't want to keep you from your next session, but thank you for being here. I hope you've left with a few tools or new ideas. You've had new conversations. I hope you'll continue those over the course of uh, the rest of uh, this forum. And thank you very much for inviting me to be with you today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.